based on your voting in the previous video where we talked about the judge's order denying the SEC's motion to strike the fair notice defense, we're going to take the opportunity to do a deeper dive into the motions to dismiss for Garlinghouse and Larson. These motions were both also denied by the court, and so in this video, we'll talk about the introduction and the background leading up to it, and in part two, we'll discuss further what the judge was looking at when she made her legal analysis and how she arrived at that final decision to deny their motions. We'll also take a look in this video at the timeline, where it all fits in right now, and how the market moved on this very bullish news yesterday. But if we haven't met before, my name is Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. So you can see the crypto market is green on the 24, up about 1%, back to 1.75 trillion, with Bitcoin at 39.1, Ethereum a hair under 2,600, and XRP up over 8% on the 24 hour. It had been up in double digits at one point on a percentage basis, but it's at about 79 cents right now. So big movements, a uh, lot of positive sentiment coming from this, knowing that the Ripple team will continue to argue the fair notice defense, and that could prove to be a major boon for the case for them and also for the crypto industry as a whole. This could increase the SEC's sense of urgency and maybe even push them more towards negotiating. We have to wait and see what happens there, but that's sort of the overall feeling that we're getting from the market right now, and you can see that reflected in the price of XRP. Now, courtesy of James K. Filan, we have an update to the timeline as of today. Day, March the 12th. So we're still waiting on several discovery related decisions that hopefully we get some answers on soon. Also, we've had recent decisions on the motion to strike the fair notice defense, which we talked about just yesterday. And today's topic, the motion to dismiss for both Garlinghouse and Larson. So first, let's talk about the DPP fight. We're still waiting on the motion for partial reconsideration of Judge Netburn's DPP opinion and order. This is related to those emails with uh, Bill Hinman. We have the motion to compel the turnover of the Easterbrook notes. That has been fully briefed, and we're waiting on a decision from Judge Netburn on whether or not those will be allowed. A DPP appeal to the second court, so if the SEC or to the Second Circuit, if the uh, SEC loses that DPP issue to um, before Judge Netburn and Judge Torres, they could file an appeal to the Second Circuit. They'd have to get past some procedural hurdles to do that, uh, to just get the opportunity to file that. Now, Ripple and the individual defendants, so that's Garlinghouse and Larson again, wanted to strike the supplemental expert rebuttal report. We looked at that yesterday, too. It was a big news day. That uh, was yesterday morning, and that was the uh, Met Dr. Metz report that we're waiting to hear an answer on again. That was just yesterday, so expect that to take some time. And then, of course, we did have recent decisions by Judge Torres in regards to the fair notice defense and the motions to dismiss. So there are still other items here that are worth noting. I'm going to link this down in the video description so you can reference this as far as requests for admission and some of these other items because we have a lot to talk about today. Now going right here again, I'll link this as well. This is the order denying the motions to dismiss. We'll be working from this document the rest of this video and in part two. Uh, again, courtesy of James K. Filan, he always is great about getting these posted online for the community to access. So that tweet and then the document itself will be linked. So let's not take any more time here and we'll dive right into it. So we have from Judge Torres the order that is denying the motions to dismiss. Garlinghouse and Larson have been attached to this case from the very beginning with them being the individual defendants that we're always referencing as we talk through the case. So the SEC has gone after the company and then these two as individuals saying all of them 
were participating in unlawful uh, offers and sales of XRP, which they are deeming to be a security. So we'll start here top to bottom um, through the main portion of the background and lead up. And so then we'll pause and in this video and then in part two, we'll pick right up with the legal analysis from the court. So here, the SEC brought this action against defendants Ripple Labs and two of its senior leaders, Brad Garlinghouse and Christian A. Larson, alleging that defendants engaged in the unlawful offer and sale of securities in violation of Section 5 of the Securities Act. The SEC also alleges that Garlinghouse and Larson, together, the individual defendants, aided and abetted Ripple's violations. The individual defendants moved separately under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 12b-6 to dismiss plaintiff's complaint for failure to state a claim. Uh, for the reasons stated below, the individual defendants' motions are denied. So both of them. Now again, here's all the background leading up to this and the main focus for today's video, this morning's video. The following facts are taken from the amended complaint and are assumed to be true for the purpose of considering the individual defendants' motions to dismiss for failure to state a claim. The SEC alleges that from 2013 to the filing of this action in 2020, Ripple violated Section 5 by selling XRP, which the SEC claims is an investment contract for which registration is required without filing a registration statement. The SEC contends that Ripple and its executives promoted XRP as an investment into a common enterprise that would increase in value and price based on Ripple's efforts. For the purposes of these motions, the individual defendants do not contest the SEC's allegations plausibly show that Ripple's sales of XRP violated Section 5. An important consideration here, taking a pause, is that on the motions to dismiss, it's not saying anything about the SEC's allegations related to Ripple sales. So that's not in contest here. It's what's happening as far as the aiding and abetting claims and all the other SEC uh, actions and claims against the defendants themselves, against Larson and Garlinghouse. Ripple was founded in 2012 by Larson and a co-founder, who is only going to be referred to here as a co-founder. Comment below if you know who that is. Around the time of Ripple's founding, the co-founder began creating the XRP Ledger, a software code that operates as a peer-to-peer -peer database spread across a network of computers that rec uh, records data rec respecting transactions, among other things. After Ripple's founding, the co-founder and others associated with Ripple created a fixed supply of 100 billion XRP, a digital asset and the native token on the XRP ledger. Larson served as Ripple's CEO from September 2012 through December 2016. When Larson was hired, Ripple was intended to continue the XRP ledger and XRP projects. In April 2015, Garlinghouse joined Ripple as its COO. Then, in January 2017, Garlinghouse took over as CEO and Larson began serving as executive chairman of Ripple's board of directors. So now she'll look at the two time periods here, Larson and then Garlinghouse in their roles as CEOs. In 2012, before Ripple began distributing XRP, Larson and other Ripple executives received two legal memoranda from a law firm. These memoranda analyze the risks associated with Ripple's distribution and monetization of XRP. The law firm warned that there was some risk XRP would be considered an investment contract by the SEC and would therefore be subject to federal securities laws. Specifically, the memoranda stated that Ripple would face an increased risk increased risk of XRP being deemed a security if individuals purchased XRP as a speculative investment, or if Ripple employees promoted the idea that XRP could increase in price. The memoranda also explained that XRP would likely not be classified as currency, an opinion reiterated in a memorandum Ripple's accountants sent to Larson in 2013. By at least 2013, Larson was aware of the contents of the memoranda and the possibility that the SEC would consider XRP a security. 
In a May 2014 email, Larson acknowledged that he received a large quantity of XRP because the legal memoranda advised that XRP may be deemed a security and he was being compensated for personally assuming the risk of being classified as an issuer of securities. From 2013 to 2014, Ripple and Larson made efforts to create a market for XRP by having Ripple distribute approximately 12.5 billion XRP to programmers through bounty programs that paid them for reporting problems in the XRPL's code. Ripple also distributed small amounts of XRP to anonymous developers and others to help establish a trading market for XRP. During that time, Ripple began to make public statements with respect to XRP that gave investors reason to believe that Ripple's efforts would produce profits. In August 2013, Ripple started selling XRP in exchange for fiat currencies and other digital assets such as Bitcoin. Both Ripple and Larson intended for their distribution of XRP to achieve network growth and raise funds for Ripple's operations. Larson explained Ripple was keeping 25% of XRP to cover the bills and using the rest of it to incent market makers, gateways, and consumers to come onto the protocol. Larson planned the initial stage of Ripple's XRP offering by approving the timing and amount of the offers and sales to 1. Purchasers in the open market, 2. Investment funds, wealthy individuals, or other sophisticated investors, these are institutional sales, and 3. Others enlisted to assist Ripple's efforts to develop an XRP market, the other XRP distributions. As CEO, Larson initiated and approved Ripple's market sales of XRP. He had final decision-making authority over which trading venues to use for market sales and how much XRP to sell in a particular venue, and Larson strategized with other Ripple employees to adjust their selling plan to stabilize and or increase the price of XRP. The goal of Ripple's XRP sales was achieving a widespread, as widespread a distribution of XRP as possible, which was necessary to promote an aftermarket of buyers and sellers of XRP. In a public interview, Larson explained that one of Ripple's key roles in making sure that Ripple distributes XRP as broadly in a way that adds as much utility and liquidity as it possibly can. He stated that he thought the incentives of Ripple and XRP purchasers are very well aligned because for Ripple to do well, it has to do a very good job in protecting the value of XRP and the value of the network. Larson described protecting the value of XRP as the guiding principle of Ripple's distribution. So pause a sec. You can see how she's formulating through history. And again, all these things are cited as being either quotations or extractions from some kind of document that uh, there was this foundational aspect where Ripple and XRP were sort of melded together in the beginning. And I think this is why, as an outcome, we may see something that says XRP in the past was a security, but it no longer is, sort of along the same lines of what we saw in Bill Hinman's speech around the arguments or statements about Ethereum. Now, there was no ICO for XRP, so this is sort of a different take, but you can see a foundation here for those types of assumptions and arguments. So let's get back into it. When Garlinghouse joined Ripple as COO, he began assisting in Ripple's distribution of XRP. He worked with Larson to coordinate the distribution strategy to increase XRP's price. Garlinghouse also began to oversee, direct, and lead Ripple's efforts to make XRP available for purchasers to buy and sell on digital asset trading platforms incorporated in the U.S. and abroad. And he participated in weekly XRP sales meetings where he exercised decision-making authority over the timing and amount of XRP sales. Since at least 2013, Ripple and Larson tried to make institutional sales to obtain essential funding for Ripple's operations and develop a speculative trading market in XRP. Garlinghouse participated in these efforts. When he was hired as COO, Larson and Garlinghouse both played significant roles in negotiating 
and approving Ripple's institutional sales, as well as other offers and sales of XRP to institutional investors. In 2015, Garlinghouse negotiated an institutional investor's purchase of XRP in connection with the investor's formation of a private investment fund whose sole purpose would have been to speculate on XRP as an investment. Both Garlinghouse and Larson received drafts of the potential offering documents for that fund. During those negotiations, Larson received an email from the fund's attorney advising him of some concerns about XRP being regulated as a security, even though it was considered a virtual currency in some contexts. In 2016, Larson and Garlinghouse approved a sale to an institutional investor described as an institutional reseller. This institutional investor explained to Garlinghouse that he purchased XRP because Larson had indicated to him that XRP was central to Ripple's success. As CEO, Larson engaged in other efforts to further Ripple's distribution of XRP. In 2015, Larson co-founded Ripple Works, an entity that invests in XRP-related projects to further Ripple's goals of achieving widespread trading of XRP in the market. Garlinghouse was also aware of Ripple Works' activities. In May 2015, Ripple agreed to settle charges brought by the U.S. Department of Justice and the U.S. FinCEN for failing to register as a money services business under the Bank Secrecy Act and for failing to comply with other regulatory requirements with respect to XRP sales. The settlement agreement called XRP a virtual currency. It's important that that gets called out in this document, and it's pointed out at this point in time prior to Garlinghouse taking over as CEO. And so these actions that they took were based on the assumption that this settlement was indeed accurate and would apply across other government agencies, that XRP is a virtual currency versus being a security. Now here's the second part. Garlinghouse's tenure as CEO uh, at the time that he became CEO through now where he still serves in that role. In January 2017, Garlinghouse took over, uh, took over as Ripple CEO. Larson, misspelled here, uh, remained executive chairman of Ripple's board of directors. Garlinghouse, Larson, and two other individuals made up the XRP sales committee, a four-member committee that made XRP distribution decisions at Ripple. Garlinghouse, as CEO, approved the timing and amounts of offers and sales of XRP and had final decision-making authority over which trading venues to use for market sales and how much XRP to sell in a particular venue. As chairman of the board, Larson was consulted on offers and sales and participated in decisions regarding Ripple's sales strategy. In February 2017, Larson expressed the view that most volume in the cryptocurrency space is speculation in advance of enterprise and eventually consumer flows. Garlinghouse also understood the importance of speculative investing as he instructed certain Ripple employees to proactively attempt to increase speculative trading value with positive XRP news. In addition, Garlinghouse was informed by a Ripple employee that Ripple's goal was to drive spe XRP speculative trading volume. In 2017 and 18, Larson and Garlinghouse worked together to convince digital asset platforms to list XRP as CEO Garlinghouse was heavily involved in attempts to partner with such platforms. Garlinghouse expressed that Ripple viewed these efforts as an example of Ripple doing whatever it can to invest in the success of the XRP ecosystem, which was consistent with what he had proactively had also proactively said publicly about Ripple's efforts. Garlinghouse also made statements suggesting that he was aware that some digital asset platforms may refuse to list XRP because they were concerned it was a security. And he helped prepare talking points intended to dispel the notion that XRP was a security or that a digital asset platform had refused to make XRP available to the public out of concerns XRP was a security. Larson and Garlinghouse also worked together to further Ripple sales to institutional investors. In 2017, Larson assisted with arranging a sale of 14.8 billion XRP 
to an institutional investor. In 2018, Garlinghouse signed an agreement with an institutional investor that described itself as operating sales and exchange services of crypto assets to offer safe and secure transactions of crypto assets for as many people as possible. To assuage investor concerns, on May 16th, 2017, Ripple announced it would place 55 billion XRP, or most of its current holdings, into a cryptographically secured escrow that would restrict Ripple to accessing only 1 billion XRP every month. And this is the S XRP escrow that we're very familiar with. That's all it will be referred to in the rest of the document here. Garlinghouse established the XRP escrow and explained that it was meant to address the concerns of XRP investors about Ripple's ability to sell its billions of XRP into the market, quote, at any time. The escrow plan was intended in part to secure speculative liquidity in XRP and drive a material increase in XRP trading volume and liquidity. Both Larson and Garlinghouse were instrumental in the formation of the XRP escrow by developing and approving the idea. Ripple and Garlinghouse publicly touted the formation of the escrow as proof that Ripple and XRP holders shared a common interest in the success of Ripple's efforts as to XRP and as one of Ripple's many efforts to manage the trading market for XRP. Garlinghouse was also involved in Ripple's efforts to promote XRP's use on a platform intended to allow money transmitting businesses to buy XRP in one jurisdiction and transfer and sell it in another location for the local fiat currency. Although, although Ripple receives only de minimis fees from the cross-border payment platform, Garlinghouse views the value creation of that platform as driving the liquidity in the XRP markets. As CEO, Garlinghouse has made numerous statements regarding Ripple's relationship to XRP and its efforts to increase XRP's liquidity and price. In a June 2017 email, he said that Ripple had a proven track record of being a good steward for XRP. He explained that a decrease in the price of XRP would certainly be bad for Ripple and reminded Ripple's equity investors and advisors that Ripple remained committed to making XRP the best digital asset for payments. In December 2017, Garlinghouse gave a public interview in which he explained that Ripple prioritized the volume of XRP sales and XRP liquidity, and he posted on Twitter that a healthy XRP market and a healthy a healthy XRP market and healthy XRP ecosystem is critically impo important to him. In January 2018, Garling has posted on Twitter that fostering a healthy XRP ecosystem is a top priority at Ripple. Moreover, in a February 2020 interview at the New York Stock Exchange, Garlinghouse explained that Ripple's efforts to create a use for XRP should correlate with a potential uh, increase in XRP price. In that same interview, Garlinghouse stated that markets would move from that speculation uh, that has driven to the crypto market to utility. Garlinghouse also expressed that Ripple was focusing on driving utility from XRP and that if Ripple was successful, it would be good for the liquidity of the whole ecosystem. In a May 2017 article published on Ripple's website, Garlinghouse further explained that Ripple's goal in distributing XRP is to incentivize actions that build trust, utility, and liquidity. And in a December 2017 interview, Garlinghouse claimed that XRP's price had recently risen because of Ripple's efforts to solve a real problem around cross-border payments, which made people excited. Moreover, in another interview in March 2018, Garlinghouse reminded investors that there's no party more interested in the success of, XRP, of the XRP ecosystem than Ripple because we own a lot of XRP. He stated that Ripple had made investments and forged partnerships in order to make sure that XRP is the most useful asset out there for solving a cross-border payment problem. During his time as CEO, Garlinghouse has made many other public statements about Ripple's clear interest and investment in promoting the price of XRP and its distribution and the ways in which Ripple's efforts would drive up the price of XRP. Garlinghouse also made statements that evinced a belief that XRP's purchasers viewed their holdings as a speculative investment. 
For example, he said that digital assets like XRP aren't currencies because very few people have used XRP to buy something, and he once stated that Ripple's activities have driven market interest in buying XRP as a speculative investment. So pausing a sec, you can see how now everything that's ever been said or done by either of these individuals is really being pulled in here, uh, whether it's a tweet or a statement in an email. So this is just a reminder to always be careful what you say and do, because if you ever find yourself in this position as they do now, it can quickly be pulled in and used uh, as part of the contextualization of things that uh, are going to be used against you as far as here where they're trying to get themselves uh, removed from this case. They're trying to have the claims against them um, dismissed and they failed. That, or that request was denied, that motion was denied. And you can see all of these statements that they've made in the past are now kind of coming to bear and forming this narrative around, well, Ripple and XRP are closely interwoven going back all these years. Now, coming back into the document, during his tenure at Ripple, Garlinghouse received some warnings that XRP may be classified as a security. In March 2017, Ripple's chief compliance officer advised Garlinghouse that XRP certainly has some securities type characteristics. The officer warned Garlinghouse that Ripple needs to hone its playbook and messaging to avoid such a classification. That same officer later advised Garlinghouse that Ripple needed to ensure the language it used in employee offer letters doesn't put Ripple at risk of XRP sounding like a security. Moreover, in July 2017, the SEC issued the Report of Investigation Pursuant to Section 21A of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, the DAO. So the DAO report, this has been cited multiple times, and now this is going to be brought in here to the conversation. So this advised that those, uh, those who would use distributed ledger or blockchain-enabled means for capital raising to take appropriate steps to ensure compliance with the federal securities laws. The Dow report found that the particular digital assets at issue were investment contracts and therefore were properly considered securities. After the Dow report's publication, Garlinghouse made comments on Ripple's website indicating that he read the report. In December 2017, Ripple's public relations firm notified Garlinghouse that the SEC chairman recently said that merely calling a token a utility token or structuring it to provide some utility does not prevent the token from being a security. The firm decided to provide that notification to Garlinghouse because there had been a concern to have XRP considered a security. In January 2018, when seeking to list XRP on a digital asset platform, Garlinghouse submitted an application in which he acknowledged that whether or not a digital asset may be considered a security as an important consideration for many in the digital asset ecosystem, and that Ripple had received a legal memorandum from a reputable law firm regarding the status of XRP under the federal securities laws. Approximately four U.S.-based digital asset platforms asked Garlinghouse for a legal opinion as to the status of XRP under the federal securities laws, and Garlinghouse was informed that after Ripple uh, failed to provide such an opinion, at least one platform declined to list XRP because of concerns XRP would be deemed a security. Garlinghouse also acknowledged that Bloomberg put out there that certain platforms are hesitant to list XRP because of concerns about it being a security. And Garlinghouse, along with Larson, met with a potential investor and spoke for a while on the outstanding issue of whether XRP gets classified as a security. In that conversation, Garlinghouse noted that although he was optimistic XRP would not be considered a security, he could not guarantee that. Now, let's look at the personal sales of both individuals of XRP. This is sort of the capstone to this discussion around the history and background and lead up here before Judge, Net or Judge Torres takes a deeper dive into the legal uh, precedence and case law to make the decision. 
So they're personal sales. In addition to facilitating Ripple's distribution of XRP, Larson and Garlinghouse sold their personal XRP in a way that was intended to strike a balance between maximizing profits while not depressing the price of XRP. Larson and his wife have sold over 1.7 billion XRP for at least $450 million. Garlinghouse has sold over 357 million XRP for approximately $159 million. Larson described his personal sale of XRP as constructive to the overall XRP market because of the widely held view that over time, it's better to have widely held assets. Garlinghouse, in discussing his personal XRP holdings, made representations that he considered XRP to be an investment vehicle and on multiple occasions stated he was, quote, long XRP. From 2017 to at least 2020, Larson and Garlinghouse offered and sold their XRP. These transactions were consummated on various digital asset trading platforms, including four incorporated in the U.S. and one incorporated abroad, but with a principal place of business in New York. At least two of the platforms incorporated in the U.S. were also U.S.-based. Larson and Garlinghouse also opened accounts with one platform's U.S.-based wholly owned subsidiary. At times, these transactions on these digital asset trading platforms occurred when XRP was allocated to investors' accounts in the records of the platform. Larson and Garlinghouse also engaged the services of a global digital asset trading firm with an office in the U.S. to make offers and sales of their XRP. Both Larson and Garlinghouse directed their XRP offers and sales from within the United States and made XRP offers and sales to persons in the United States. So that's where we'll end part one here. But she's wrapping this up with the background saying, you tried to make these claims that your sales were abroad, but we have the evidence here. U.S.-based exchanges, you uh, made the orders from the U.S., and your offers and sales happened on multiple platforms, including U.S.-based ones. So all in all, based on the background, you both, Garlinghouse and Larson, have had a voice in what Ripple did as far as offering and selling XRP, the timing and amounts. You personally held large quantities of XRP, which you exchanged for millions of dollars, and you did that from the U.S. Therefore, you are under the uh, scope and purview of the court here. And so because of that, you can see the argument forming that this is going to be denied. Now, this is all in advance of the legal arguments. This is just from the background. The story's already been told here, everything that happened from 2012 through 2020 when this started. And now you can see that picture of where the starting point for the legal discussion begins. So she's done a good job here of summarizing what's been presented in the initial filing, in Ripple's filings, and in the individual defendant's filings uh, against that uh, filing against them, against this lawsuit. But now with that starting point, we can dive into the legal details. So with that said, make sure you hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for that video later this weekend, where we'll go through the legal analysis, the application of the standard, and all all of the citations and examples she's going to use as to why they were denied this opportunity to have the claims against them dismissed. Hit a like if you found any value here. I know this is longer than some of our normal conversations, but it is beneficial to take a deeper dive and look through what's happening and how they're framing everything because this isn't just how the SEC will approach Ripple. Other executives and leaders in crypto firms could face similar actions and you can see these arguments being made and how everything's being pieced together and so it's a reminder for all of us not just executives that you must be extraordinarily careful in what you say and do and how it can be construed in the future i do hope you found this to be helpful i hope you have a fantastic rest of your weekend stay tuned for part two and much more to come and i will see you in the next one